Now the reading from St. Matthew's Gospel, parts of the 11th chapter. Jesus spoke to the crowd, saying, To what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He is a demon. The son of man came, eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated. Since last Sunday, I will confess to you that I had a bit of a meltdown. If you've known me for a while, you might suspect it was another instance of road rage. Those who know me well know that I am a bit of an impatient driver. But my meltdown was not set off by road rage this past week. It was set off by an encounter, a conversation with our nation's third largest bank. I'll give you a little background. Right about now, my household is preparing to submit its tax returns, six months of quarterly tax payments, and last year's IRA funding. We, when COVID-19 hit, kept tithing, kept paying and paying our bills. But if the government was going to give us some extra time to handle those taxes and IRA donations, we were going to take it. Keep as much liquid cash on hand as possible. That was our philosophy. What we did was stash all of those tax monies, all of those retirement monies, in an account with our nation's third largest bank, drawing 13% more of an interest, 13 times more interest than we would at any local bank. Seemed like a good idea. Keep the money on hand, draw a much higher interest rate than you would locally. And for a long time, it seemed like a good plan. Until this past week, when I tried to withdraw the money. And guess what? Our nation's third largest bank put up hurdle after hurdle after hurdle, after hurdle, after hurdle. Do you think that drew my ire a little bit? Oh yes, it got the blood boiling. I now have overcome all of those hurdles, but boy was it aggravating. Boy was it exasperating. And I'm sorry to say, I think there's probably someone in New York City whose ears are still ringing at this very moment. Now, I don't know about you, but when I have a meltdown, I usually feel bad about it afterwards. Having now lived for 52 years, I can look back on my life and see certain recurring patterns of which I'm not always proud. Righteous indignation is one of them. When I come into the presence of what seems to be misdoing, when I catch the slightest whiff of dirty pool, I have for all my life gone from zero to 60 in no time at all. It's not that this is always bad. The Bible is full of examples of righteous indignation, but sometimes it's overkill. Why can't I differentiate? Why can't I sometimes be cool and composed rather than right at 60 degrees right out of the bat. It's a change I'd like to make, but I find it very, very difficult to make. Getting over this whole righteous indignation thing for me is 
like being stuck to a lily pad. I just can't jump off this lily pad of righteous indignation. And evidently, I'm not alone in this regard. According to our reading from Romans, we all spend a lot of our lives on lily pads, which aren't necessarily good for us, consistently failing to find that which will lead our lives forward. It's not that we all have the same sticky lily pad. We don't, thankfully. My sticky lily pad is righteous indignation. Yours might be impulse fine. It might be being too compromising. It might be being too demanding. The lily pads vary from person to person, but we've all got them. If we were to think of ourselves as frogs, we're not very good frogs. We find it very, very hard to leap from lily pad to lily pad. Agree? It's why we all can relate to what St. Paul has to say in his reading from Romans this morning when he says, I don't understand my actions. I don't do what I want to do. I think we've all acknowledged we've been there. We're human beings, not frogs. We find it difficult to jump from one lily pad to the next. And when we fail to jump from those lily pads, what do we do? We beat ourselves up. We say, why can't I get this handled? Why am I such a wimp? Why am I such a loser? And even when we aren't beating up on ourselves, what might we do when we see someone else who's struggling with a lily pad that we find to be a breeze? We might kick them around a little bit. It's a vicious cycle. How do we break it? How do we become more patient with ourselves while at the same time being more patient with others? Recognizing that we all have our own sticky lily pad. I think it really does come back to remembering that we are human beings not frogs. Frogs jump from lily pad to lily pad as if it were nothing. We do not. Sometimes it takes us years and years and years just to move to the edge of a troublesome lily pad. And who knows how many more years it will be before we actually jump. I think I've confessed to you before that I'm a former smoker, you know how many years it took me to quit that? Well over 20. Another example of how it's hard to jump off of these sticky lily pads. And the nation, in our nation's history, the history we celebrate this weekend, is and is not indicative of how hard it can be for us human beings to change, how hard it can be for us human beings to progress. If you think about it, the first 30 years of our nation's history are pretty miraculous. We Americans are acting like we're frogs rather than human beings. We're jumping from lily pad to lily pad like it's nothing at all. Just run down the history with me. 244 years ago yesterday, we declared our independence from Great Britain. How long did it take us to defeat what was at that time one of the world's greatest superpowers? Five years. That's frog-like, not human being-like. And then we adopted the Articles of Confederation, bad governing document. How long did it take us to scrap the Articles of Confederation? Just six years. That's frog-like, not human being-like. And then between 1791 and 1804, how many times did we amend the Constitution that we adopted in 1787? Twelve times. We amended the Constitution twelve times in just 13 years. 
That's frog-like, not human being-like. During the first 30 years of our history, we are changing, 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 and changing, jumping from lily pad to lily pad. And then all of a sudden, the brakes go on, and things slow down suddenly. After the 12th Amendment is adopted in 1804, it's over 60 years before the Constitution is amended again to abolish slavery. Then, it's another 55 years or so before the Constitution is amended again so that women like Mary Ann Mapes can vote at the polls. And then, it's basically another 45 years before the Constitution is amended again so that minorities might stop having so much trouble at the polling place. Unless you count reducing the voting age to 18 as a major amendment, and I don't, it's basically been nothing since then. On a constitutional level, basically nothing has happened in our country for going on 60 years. Is that because we've landed on the perfect lily pad? and have no problems and issues to sort out? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Ben. It's obvious. We still have lily pads from which we need to jump as a society. But it hasn't happened. Why is that? Because we're human beings, not frogs. We find it very difficult to jump from lily pad to lily pad. The first 30 years of our nation's history is the anomaly, not the norm. We get stuck on difficult lily pads, and for whatever reason, we find it hard to jump. And boy, oh boy, would it be good for us to remember this more often. If we did remember it more often, we'd start to realize just how much we really need each other. Each of us has got our own sticky lily pad, so none of us brings the whole puzzle to the situation. We all just bring a piece of the puzzle to the situation. Sometimes my righteous indignation is going to be a benefit to this community, to this church, and others. I remember a couple of years ago, I became aware that the son of one of our shut-ins was stealing your money. Do you think I got a little righteously indignant when I learned that? Oh yeah, and that was beneficial. But sometimes, that righteous indignation of mine can go overboard and be a drag. And when that happens, you're going to need somebody else around. Somebody who's more cool and calm and composed and unflappably confident that progress will roll on. But then again, sometimes those calm, cool, everything is going to be okay people are really living in denial and failing to recognize that there are times when action is needed now, not later. When folks who are so calm, cool, and composed and unflappable are living in denial, are they going to need some people in the community who are a little more assertive? Yes. None of us brings everything to the puzzle of life required to put it all together. We need each other. Sometimes we're going to need people who operate from the heart. It would be interesting to take a survey this morning, but I bet you if I ask how many of you operate from the heart primarily, there would be a number of hands that went up. But it's not just heart people that we need. Sometimes we need people who operate primarily from the head. I bet you if I took a survey this morning, the people who didn't raise their hand when they said they operate from the heart would raise their hand and say they operate from the head. We're stronger together than we ever will be apart. Sometimes we need people who see things from the edges, from the margins. Sometimes we need people who see things from the center. And the only way we're going to have all these people we need so that we can draw upon their gifts when we need them is to make room for everybody's lily pad in our life together. 
You can't have my righteous indignation just when it's a positive. It's all of me or none of me. I can't have your calm, composed, unflappable trust of progress just when it's beneficial. I also have to make room for it when it's not beneficial. Is all of you or none of you? You see how incredibly important it's going to be for us to be patient in our dealings with one another, to bring perspective to our dealings with one another. Do you see how important it's going to be when we're interacting with one another to remember they're just another human being like me? They have their own sticky lily pad, and as, as, and as it's difficult for me to jump from my sticky lily pad, so it is for them. You see how key this is going to be? It's the only way we're going to pack our trailer for all that life will bring our way. If we're not patient with ourselves and others, we're going to shoo ourselves to the shadows, we're going to shoo somebody else to the shadows, and what happens when we need the gifts that we or somebody else who's been shooed to the shadow could have brought? We're out of luck. We need to remember that we are human beings, not frogs. We need to be patient with one another. We need to practice perspective. We need to have interpersonal panache. Amen. It's while I'll end by referencing the final thing that St. Paul says today in our reading from Romans. After confessing to the Romans and to us today that he has his own sticky lily pads from which he finds it difficult to jump, St. Paul ends by saying this, Wretched man that I am, who shall save me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. Siblings in the Lord, this is the gospel. This is the good news that Jesus will give us all the patience, all the perspective, all the interpersonal panache we need to pack our van with all the people we'll need for the road. Let's remember, where does Jesus promise to be? Where does Jesus promise to help us pack the van? Where two or more are gathered in my name, there I will be, says Jesus. And then about ten chapters later, he says, where they're baptizing in the triune name, where they're teaching my way, my life, my truth, there I will be until the end of the age. Put it all together, and it's something you've heard before, but something we consistently need to remember. Jesus has got all the patience, all the perspective, all the interpersonal panache we need. But we miss out on it if we miss out on worship. And so, as much as possible, let's be in worship, whether inside the sanctuary or out in the back parking lot. And let's bring as many invited and welcome guests along as possible. If we gather with one another in Jesus often enough, what do we get? All the patience, all the perspective, all the inner part and personal monotony. And that would be a good thing, wouldn't it?